Welcome to Baker Briefing. Today's episode is from Mexico Centered, a podcast from the Baker Institute Center for the U.S. and Mexico that explores all facets of the U.S.-Mexico relationship, including trade, which is the topic of our conversation today. I'm Tony Payan. Hosting this episode with me as well is David Gantz, the Baker Institute's Will Clayton Fellow on International Economics and Trade. You can subscribe to Mexico Centered on Apple, Spotify, or whatever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening. International trade has flourished in recent decades in the U.S., which is both the world's largest importer and exporter of goods and services. Trade has lowered the costs of everyday goods, raised the living standard, and fueled job growth. But it has also eliminated some jobs, mostly in manufacturing. As a result, support for free trade has declined. Today, American policymakers are embracing industrial policies which are designed to promote specific sectors, especially manufacturing, in a way not seen since the 1980s. President Biden's Buy American policies are a prime example of this. How can we rebuild trust in trade and use it to ensure that the U.S. remains competitive globally? To discuss, I'm joined by C.J. Mahoney, former Deputy U.S. Trade Representative and Chief U.S. Negotiator for the United States-Mexico-Canada Agreement, or USMCA, between 2017 and 2020, and David Gantz, the Baker Institute's Will Clayton Fellow in Trade and International Economics. Together, we'll explore major challenges on the horizon for U.S. trade policy, including the upcoming review of the USMCA, which is slated for 2026, and of course, the rising influence of China. CJ, welcome. Well, thank you. Thank you. It's so great to be back at the Baker Institute. Thank you. CJ, in 2026, the U.S., Mexico, and Canada are to review and revise the USMCA. What can we expect? How do you see this going down, especially with a new administration in Mexico, still uncertain as to what their wishes are, an election in the United States coming up in November, and certainly an election in Canada within the next 12 months? Well, there, for all those reasons, Tony, there are a lot of uncertainties. And, and this will be a new process. There's never been a provision like the review and extension provision that we have in USMCA. The idea was that this would be a disciplining mechanism that would force policymakers in all three countries to continue to update the agreement to make sure that we wouldn't be in a situation like we found ourselves in 2017 with an agreement that was out of date and politically unpopular. One of two things will happen in July of 2026, neither of which will be the end of USMCA. But if the three parties all agree to renew, then the term of the agreement is extended for another 16 years. If they don't agree, then a slow clock starts to tick for 10 more years toward the theoretical termination of the agreement in 2036. I doubt that the agreement ultimately will be terminated. But as I just think about the political dynamics and the realities of trade negotiations, I think at this point that the chances for all three parties agreeing to renew for another 16 years on or in advance of the six-year anniversary date are actually quite low. And I think that for a couple of reasons. One is just that I'm just not sure that policymakers in all three countries are going to focus on this in time. And the electoral calendar certainly doesn't help with that. The other thing is that this is not going to be just a checking of the box exercise from the United States. There are some real concerns. There are concerns about energy policy in Mexico, concerns about labor, some concerns even with U.S.-Canada trade. So it'll take some time to get those worked out. I also just think from the perspective of the United States, at least, the costs of not renewing immediately are actually relatively low because the agreement is still going to last for another 10 years. And so whether Donald Trump or Kamala Harris win the presidency, I think that the inclination to just kick the can down the road will be pretty strong. So I would urge Mexico and Canada to really think about that and have a strategy for accelerating the negotiations. Because the other thing is, it's not clear to me what the natural trigger would be for a renewal, even within the 10 year period. The parties can renew at any time, but it would be a real shame if we got to the end of that long period and lived with uncertainty throughout the duration before there was a renewal. My guess is that this makes the business environment quite uncertain. I mean, the companies plan for five, 10 years, long-term plans. They have to open manufacturing facilities. They have to invest, and that takes a long time. Uh, Doesn't that really introduce a lot of uncertainty? And doesn't that weaken the idea of a North American competitive platform vis-a-vis, say, China and Europe. They're going to look at North America and they're going to say, well, they're not quite united. And that's kind of a geostrategic weakness, so to speak. I think that's right to some extent, but I think that the costs of the uncertainty are less at the beginning of the 10-year period than at the end. 
on the one hand, I agree, this is a hugely important relationship. The idea that you wouldn't have a free trade agreement united these three countries would be a very big deal. And you saw what the reaction to that possibility was during the Trump administration. But at the same time, I think there will probably be some confidence that at the end of the day, before 2036, the three parties would get together. 10 years is still a long time, even in terms of, of business planning cycles. So again, I just go back to the idea that it would be unthinkable not to renew in 2026. I just think is wrong, especially from the perspective of the United States. I think that's a very tolerable outcome. And just to be clear, it's not the outcome that I personally would prefer. I would like to see an immediate renewal. But I think a lot of work is going to have to be done between now and then to make that possible. Yeah. David, just following up on that, as I have suggested elsewhere, finding a good year to renew is hard for political reasons. Either you have 2026 when we're supposed to do this is a few months from congressional elections in the U.S. 2027 is three-year congressional elections in Mexico. 2028 is another presidential election. Maybe 2029 is the magic year. 2030, another election in Mexico. So there's never going to be a really convenient time to do it. And I guess the risks for, I don't know, nobody's going to stop investing in the U.S., but certainly it's going to create some uneasiness and some hedging of bets, don't you think? I think that's certainly a risk. Again, I think at the beginning of the period, the risks of that are lower than at the end. But it could just be one of these things. And unfortunately, in democracies, when there are decisions that the inclination to just kick the can down the road is the path of least resistance. So I think there's a real chance of that happening, which is, again, why I really think policymakers in all three countries should start focusing on this now. Because there have been a lot of developments in trade policy even over the last four years. I mean, we've seen the rise of this massive Chinese EV sector. We've seen a pandemic, the various issues with supply chains, the IRA. I mean, there are a lot of things to talk about and discuss. You know, unfortunately, some of the old trade irritants are still there as well. Yeah. Let me go back to those issues specifically. I think I would think of them as two layers of issues. One is the very specific conflicts that there are over softwood dairy, some issues in Mexico, like the labor issues, the special mechanism to address those kinds of issues. But there's something deeper here. There's kind of a, a, an anti-trade environment, and you can feel it in the United States, but you can also feel it in Mexico. And now with a more nationalistic administration in Mexico, and we don't know where Scheinbaum, Claudia Scheinbaum, the incoming president, is going to go, but I have to presume that she's also very ideological and somewhat going by the playbook that Mr. Lopez Obrador is going to leave her. She's going to be very constrained. Mexico is now creating a state-led company to deal with minerals like lithium. It's retrenching on electricity. It's retrenching on hydrocarbons. It's creating a more nationalistic environment when it comes to airports and certain public investments and things like that. I guess you're absolutely right. Can you specify what some of the U.S. concerns would be specifically and also address the issue of the recent judicial reform in Mexico, which reduces the possibilities of companies going straight to federal judges in Mexico and address their concerns on a collective basis. What exactly can we expect from Washington in terms of these concerns over what's going on in Mexico today? There are no shortage of issues. I think I would maybe put them in two groupings, though. I think that there are the tier one issues, which are the most consequential and also to some extent the most difficult. And then there are the and what I would say are the kind of the garden variety trade irritants. Some of those things like softwood lumber, dairy with Canada, tomatoes with Mexico. Those are persistent trade irritants. I think that there will be ways to resolve those and, and muddle through. I, I don't think that renewal will hinge on those issues. But in the, the tier one issues, I think that they are the ones that you mentioned. They're energy, labor, autos, and then this new issue of the judicial reforms in Mexico. I think on autos, the real question with autos, I think, is just what policy do these three countries want to have regarding imports of Chinese autos, auto parts, and also to some extent direct investment from China. And that's a, it's a complicated issue. I'm not going to take a position on it here, but I just think it makes sense that if we're going to have an integrated North American economy, we really need to have the same approach to this issue in all three countries. It doesn't make sense for the United States to have one very restrictive policy for Mexico to have a different policy and then to allow a third country, China or anybody else to arbitrage basically between the two regimes. I suspect that that could be worked out. I think even though that's probably the easiest issue of the four, the labor issue, Mexico's made a lot of progress in implementing its labor reforms. Although I think the last statistics that I saw was that although there have been votes only on something like 20 to 30% of contracts, those contracts represent over half of unionized workers in Mexico. But if you look at the Labor Advisor Committee reports in the United States that have come out, there are still a lot of issues with violence directed at labor organizers 
organizers, with the funding of Mexico's labor institutions, and with the continued influence of the so-called protection unions. So I think that the U.S. labor unions are going to have a big voice in this from the U.S. side. In either a Trump or a Harris administration, the head of the Teamsters spoke at the Republican National Convention. You know, they didn't endorse anybody, which compared to the status quo was, you know, seemed to be a, a good thing for the for the Trump campaign. So I think in either administration, the voice of organized labor in this is going to be important. What I would urge Mexico to do is to start talking with the U.S. labor unions now. I think the more progress that they can make in fully implementing the labor reforms and making progress on these issues between now and the renewal date, the better position they will be in. Because if they're in a position of saying, of even taking on additional commitments, but saying these commitments will be in the future, I would imagine a lot of people in the U.S. labor community will say, well, that's nice, but there's no great rush to renew this agreement. Why don't you implement the reforms first, and then we can talk about renewal. On energy, that's just an issue that's going to have to be resolved. It's hard for me to see, just to make the issue very narrow, it's hard for me to see a situation in which the U.S. renews the agreement while the pending energy dispute regarding preferences for Pemex is pending. And as you know, there are other issues with critical minerals and the like. You know, And then you get to the issue of the judicial reforms. And I only know what I read in the papers and The Economist, but you know, certainly there have been a lot of concerns raised on the U.S. side. And those aren't just concerns of civil society. They're also concerns of U.S. business. Yeah. David? No, just follow up on the judicial reforms, I think that one of the big watershed moments for Scheinbaum is going to be the first half of next year, because many of the observers have predicted chaos because of dozens or hundreds of people running for judgeships. And I wonder if that goes badly, if that is going to have an impact on a year later when we have the 2026 review. I hadn't thought about that, but just the actual logistics of having elections for all of the judges in Mexico, and I, I'm not familiar enough with the details of it to know in what time period. There'll be thousands of candidates on the ballot. Half of them are 2025, and the other half are 2027, and there's a great deal of concern about unqualified candidates or candidates that are owned by the cartels. Well, it's also, looking back on the history of NAFTA, and obviously people have different views about NAFTA, I think North American economic integration is a good thing for all the three countries and is, is quite necessary. Although at the same time, I think NAFTA was out of date and it needed to be revised. But I think one of the unqualified successes of NAFTA was that it did lead to some institutional reform in Mexico in the judiciary. And scholars who have looked at it have said if the ways in which Mexico changed for the better from 1994 to 2020, the rise of an independent judiciary was at the, at the very top of the list. And so you know, this raises questions about uh, whether that will continue to be the case. Some people think that this was a way for Mexico to legislate itself from outside. In other words, Salinas had this particular strategy. It's very difficult to pass certain yeah. reforms, domestic reforms. But if we commit to them in a treaty, then I have to go back to Congress and say, to benefit from that treaty, then we have to make these changes. It looks like we've come full circle now. Yeah. Will Scheinbaum take advantage of that opportunity again and say, to get the renewal whether it's in 26 or 27 or 28, then we need to make those changes. The problem that I see there is that she's facing, obviously, a Congress that's much more radicalized, ideological, perhaps co-opted by Mr. Lopez Obrador, so she'll be operating under his long shadow. It'll be a lot more difficult than for, and it's not coming on the heels of a lost decade, the 1980s, which was a very difficult time. So will the United States impose certain requirements like you sort of suggested in advance of a renewal and say, these are the changes that we need to see. We don't need to renew it in 26. We got 10 more years. When we see those changes, then we talk. I think it's very difficult, just given that this whole debate over judicial reform has happened right now, and the renewal will just be in a couple years. I think it will be very difficult for the U.S. to ignore the issue. At the same time, I think it will be difficult for the Mexican government to completely pivot on it while still saving face. I mean, one of the things you learn in trade negotiations, and I think in any negotiations, is that I mean, the idea of just grinding the other side into the dust and forcing them to do what you want them to do generally doesn't work, and especially doesn't work when you're dealing with governments most of the time, because both sides need to be able to leave with their heads held high and with some degree of dignity. And the, the U.S. dictating the terms of how Mexico should structure its judiciary in the aftermath of such recent legislation, that will be difficult to see how that's resolved. I mean, maybe there is something about in the implementation of this, maybe it could, something could be done to where it could be done slower, perhaps certain offices could be removed. I imagine that there are a lot of, of possibilities, but it will certainly take some creative problem solving to get through this issue. I think that's a very valid point. I mean, there's been a lot of discussion within Mexico over the last three or four months about whether, you know, how do these judicial reforms violate U.S 
USMCA? And I think the short answer is, as pass, they don't do it. But they raise all sorts of questions of most favored nation treatment in the investment and the trade area. They reiterate some of the violations of the investment provisions, particularly in the petroleum and the electrical power areas. I think there's some tools that the U.S. government could use if it were willing to do so, and if it doesn't continue to be dominated by immigration issues rather than trade issues. Do you think so? Well, it's also a question, who are the judges who are elected? We have elected judges in the United States. We have them in most municipalities, in most states. And it's not as if the elected judiciaries are completely beholden to public opinion. They're, for the most part, still pretty professional. We don't have that at the federal level, but there's a mixed system. It's it's not you know, pretty, you know, preordained, I imagine, that this is going to lead to complete elimination of any independence of the judiciary. But clearly, a lot of concerns have, have been raised, and you know, what it ultimately looks like at the end will have a huge impact on the U.S.-Mexico relationship. I also agree with you, Dad. There are other tools that the U.S. has. We have the dispute settlement process on particular issues. It'll be interesting to too, for example, when we see some of the like the dispute settlement case on uh, genetically modified corn, so we'll see how that comes out. If it comes out, is Mexico going to comply with it? I think a sign of confidence that could come out of this would be if you know if Mexico loses the case, and I don't know the details of it, but. If Mexico loses the case and decides to abide by the decision, I think that's something that would increase confidence in that the rule of law in Mexico still exists. On the other hand, if Mexico ignores the decision, that could lead to another outcome. And who knows? uh, These things generally tend to be complicated. And there still is investor state dispute settlement as well in the energy sector. A number of cases have been filed. And how the Mexican government responds to the judgments in those cases, I think, will also be quite telling. I think you're right about that. I think some of the concerns about the judicial reform are concerns about the legal profession in Mexico, where you have over 100 law schools, some of them with 20 or 25 students, and where once you graduate from those law schools, you become a licenciado. There's no bar exam. Equally important, there's no character and fitness exam. So you really don't have much control over who is eligible to be judges. And if they're selected primarily by Moreno, and probably indirectly, at least by some of the drug cartels, there's a big area I think that some are worried about. Yeah. I guess I'm thinking about the USMCA as sort of a strategic piece in a broader partnership. You know, what's going on between Mexico and the United States and Canada, if you will, but certainly between Mexico and the United States for our purposes here is quite complex. And we need a framework of cooperation that involves trade and economic integration, that involves climate change and sustainable development, border infrastructure, security cooperation. There's all kinds of issues. And I feel that Washington has failed to put together a strategy, and this goes back to the Trump administration, but also certainly under the Biden administration, that Mexico has played the immigration card very, very well and said, look, if you want me to contain the flows of hundreds of thousands of immigrants and create another border crisis, then you have to look the other way on a lot of other issues. Do you see that Washington can develop a strategy that will involve a review and revision of the USMCA as part of a broader strategy, or are we still going to allow Mexico to divvy up the agenda so that they can gain the upper hand on a particular issue of concern to us, and then we are obliged, on the other hand, to ignore the other items on the agenda? It's a good question, and I'm honestly kind of two minds about what Washington should do, and let me explain why. In the USMCA negotiations, a decision was made early on that this was going to be a negotiation about trade. It wasn't going to be a negotiation about immigration. From the perspective of somebody who was responsible for getting the trade deal done, that was very helpful. (laughs) Because if the two issues had been intertwined, I think it would have been very difficult, if not impossible, to get the deal done. You'll recall there was a brief episode where, at one point, President Trump threatened to impose tariffs on Mexico because of the of the migration issue. That then led to the agreement that Secretary Pompeo negotiated, and it went away. But as that was happening at the time, I was thinking this is all over with. If this becomes, we have enough difficulties in getting an agreement and getting it through Congress, if this becomes about immigration as well, we're sunk. At the same time, Tony, I think you're right. There are so many issues. This is such an important strategic relationship. I I think if there's one thing where you can criticize the U.S. government when it comes to Mexico is that even when there are good intentions, it's a relationship that just is always put on the back burner because there's always something more immediate, whether it's, you know, the Middle East or the Taiwan Strait or something else. And in in some ways, it's because the the ties with Mexico are so strong. Generally, other than the migration situation, you don't get it to a boiling point. But what that means is that there just isn't the focus. I mean, I would love to see some sort of comprehensive strategy on the U.S., Mexico, Canada relationship that really focuses on how do we make progress on all of these issues. I just think that there's no choice for 
particularly for Mexico, I would say. And I, I realize that this is difficult because Mexico is a, is a proud country. It's got a rich culture and history. It wants to maintain its sovereignty. But in the world in which we now live, there's really no other path for Mexico other than integrating more closely with the United States. And I think Mexico is also really important to the United States, but the United States obviously has a bigger role in, in, in the rest of the world. I would like to see, though, a future administration really focus on this relationship, make it a huge priority. I actually think it's something that, you know, it's, it's a, a shame. I think the, the president that was most interested in U.S.-Mexico relations that we've had in recent years was George W. Bush. Yeah, and I think actually the Bush administration, it would have been, it's interesting to think of an alternative history where there hadn't been 9-11. I think that the Bush administration's foreign policy would have been focused much more on Mexico and Latin America. But of course, that's not the road that we went down. Right, exactly. David, last question, because uh, I think we're about to uh, run out. No, I, think, I think it's probably useful just to follow up on that. I mean, I've used the comment benign neglect or not so benign neglect. Yeah. And frankly, it's been true much of the Trump administration, although they get huge credit, in my view, for negotiating NAFTA 2.0. But it's certainly true of the Biden administration as well. It's not surprising. They're, as you say, they're distracted by Taiwan and China and the Middle East and God knows by Afghanistan for a while. So you, you really think there's a possibility that a new administration will be able to do better? Well, hope springs eternal. And there's certainly the possibility there are so many distractions in the world. I mean, I guess the, the way that I would think that there would be the best chance of that, though, is if the U.S. could see Mexico as part of the solution to dealing with some of our supply chain issues. Mexico's certainly got to be part of the solution in dealing with the migration issues. I think the next president, whoever it is, actually would be well served by appointing somebody, and not a special envoy, but somebody in the cabinet, somebody who has powers close to the president, to really be responsible for this relationship and for all aspects of it. And really make it a priority and have that person's job be to fix the relationship with Mexico, figure out what we're going to do on migration, figure out what we're going to do on energy, on USMCA renewal, and really have it be the charge of that person to get it done. If it was set up in that way, maybe that person would have the license and the authority to get it done. But it's almost like a cousin or something that, you know, you, you lose touch with and, you know, you, you'll see them at Thanksgiving, but you don't necessarily call them in between. And unfortunately, that's kind of how the relationship between U.S. administrations and Mexico has gone, at least in recent times. Well, thank you, CJ. This has been a very good conversation. Obviously, we had a big panel this morning. If anybody wants to see the content of the panel, it'll be on our website, bakerinstitute.org slash Mexico. And I think you'll find it there, and you'll find this conversation there as well. Thanks for visiting us. Baker Briefing is brought to you by the Baker Institute for Public Policy, which provides meaningful nonpartisan policy analysis on the most critical challenges facing the U.S., Texas, and the world. This episode was produced by Lisa Wakita and Karina Zimel. AV production was led by Kevin Young. Thanks for joining us.